So I wanted to take a break from lighting, but realized that it would be nice to have at least some visualization where the light is. Uh, right, because right now you can't really see where the light is, you can only uh, like see that it's moving, uh, which is not very visual. And it would be nice to draw some shape where the light is, maybe with the same color as the light, right? And for that I made this Shapes Odin module that can generate a plane and box meshes for now. And I did it off the record because even though it looks simple enough now, coming up with it actually required quite some focus, which is something that is pretty hard to achieve while talking. So here first I define some helpers, like this shape context is just a container for vertices and indices that we've seen before, as well as this next vertex ID and index ID fields. And then I have this add vertex that simply adds it to the vertices slice and the add triangle that adds the indices uh, for a triangle and increments the uh, next ID. Then uh, this build plane procedure uh, that takes the start position and UV and the normal as well as the configuration for each side of the plane, how many segments does it have and the position and UV steps to advance for each segment. So we can build planes uh, split it in multiple segments. And then we simply generate vertices uh, for each segment and note that the range for the for loop here uses the equal sign and that is because we want to generate one more vertex on each side to close the final segment. Then it just generates the quotes of two triangles for each segment, so this is nothing too fancy, it's more or less how we did it in the early videos before implementing the OBJ loader. Uh, it's just a bit generalized. And then we have this helper methods uh, to get the number of vertices and indices for given number of segments. And that corresponds to what we just saw. So we add an extra vertex to close the side, hence plus one here. And for indices we need uh, two triangles, three vertices each, so we have three multiplied by two for each segment. And then we use these helpers in the actual mesh generation procedures, for example here we have this generate plane mesh, uh, which gets number of vertices and indices, and allocates the slice using those values, right? Then we define some helper variables, uh, and we want our plane origin point to be at its center, so we start uh, generate vertices from half width and half depth. And I call the Z dimension depth uh, because the word like length might be confusing in different contexts with the slice lengths and whatnot. And I use the word front for the side that has positive Z by the way. Because if our forward vector is negative Z, then the front is a face that faces the forward vector. So that's my logic, but I'm actually not sure if it's consistent with how front is defined in other 3D software, so we might want to change this later. And then we just call the build plane with appropriate uh, arguments to fill the vertices and indices slice with correct values. And finally we call our upload mesh procedure just like we do with OBJ uh, to upload that to the GPU buffers. Now the generate box mesh is similar except that it does that uh, six times uh, for each side of the box and you can specify width, height and depth, as well as the number of segments for each dimension. So we calculate the length of our slices, define the extents and steps, and then we just call build plane for each side with proper arguments. Maybe one thing to note here is that the opposite planes have one of their coordinates inverted. For example here, at the top, we increment x normally, right? So we start from left and increment by dx on each step of the side. But for the bottom, in addition to setting the bottom y coordinate in the start position, we also set x to the right and then step by minus dx. And this has to do with the winding and back face culling. So remember we set up this cull mode, rasterizer state field in our pipeline, and that says back, meaning that it will cull the back face and not try to draw them. Well, how does it know what is a back face? Well, and there's actually another related setting in the GPU rasterizer state structure uh, and I think I briefly mentioned it before and that is this front face, which is counterclockwise by default, uh, meaning that the vertices or indices if we use indexed rendering, uh, which we do. So for the front face of the triangle they should be defined in the counterclockwise order. Now our index generation code here in build plane doesn't really account for that, 
But another way, of course, is to just make our vertex coordinates so that the defined order becomes clockwise or counterclockwise. And that's why we do that for the opposite box planes. Now I know it may sound confusing, because it's actually pretty easy to get confused by all these numbers, and that's okay. I think I spent a couple hours figuring this basic stuff out myself, and I'll totally prepare to spend more in future. You can study the code in the repo, or better yet, if you still struggle with the concepts of winding and face culling. I recommend going back to the beginning, to maybe part 4 or 5, uh, where we still had a basic code and just playing around with the vertex order and different phase uh, order and culling settings in the GPU rasterizer state when we create our pipeline. Now let's check if that works. So let's maybe create some models and some entities uh, using those generated geometry. And remember we have this cobblestone texture, right? So maybe let's create a floor plane using that texture. Not sure if that will look very nice, but at least we can check if that works correctly. So let's load our cobblestone texture again. Then add a new model using this texture and the generated plane mesh. So like this, we generate a plane mesh of size 10 by 10 meter and we use the cobblestone as a diffuse texture with no speculars. Now we can go to our entities slice and just add one using this model. That would be model with the index 3, right? So now we have some kind of floor here, which is nice, and that also reacts to the light, so that seems to be working so far. Now this makes me think that maybe we should add a texture scaling to the generated meshes, so the UV coordinates could use the repeating of tiling textures to make this cobblestone a bit smaller. So let's add a to-do about this, something like this. Now we should also probably add a box here uh, to make sure that that works. And Kenny also has this handy set of prototype textures that could be also used to ensure that the texture mapping is correct. So let's maybe use this one, one by one meter wall. So let's see how that looks like on our box. So I copied the texture here in the texture folder. Let's load it. And let's generate another model, which would be just a cube with this texture. Something like this, one by one by one meter cube. Uh, using this texture and with some shininess. Let's just add another model like this. Let's set its position, maybe 3 meters to the right, half a meter uh, above the ground, because remember the origin is at the center of the cube, and maybe 3 meters to the back, uh, so it doesn't intersect with our um, vehicles. And here it is, seems to be working. The light seems to be working on it as well. So let's get back to our light visualization. We could create another smaller cube mesh and simply draw it at the light position using the light's color. One problem with that though is that currently we only have a single way to draw things, right? And that is our shaders and the pipeline that we create using them for drawing objects that can be nicely lit uh, by our light. But what about the light itself? Well, maybe we could get away with the same pipeline if we provided some way to configure the emitted radiance. This one, right? And the diffuse map that is completely black, so it doesn't reflect anything. But that feels completely unnecessary to do all this lighting calculation for drawing just a simple colored cube, right? So instead, let's just create another very simple pair of shaders and configure our graphics pipeline specifically to draw the light shape. So let's start by copying our current shaders and renaming them to something like light shape shader. Then let's open the fragment shader and check what we could remove here. Well, the global constants buffer actually has all the information we need, even more than that, right? And if you remember, this global data is pushed once for the whole frame. So it's kind of already there. So maybe let's just use it as is, right? We don't really need the local buffer because we don't have a material to process, right? And in the main function, we have this incoming radiance, right? And for a light source, that would be just the emitted radiance, right? So the outgoing one. So what we could do is just keep this variable and remove everything else. Now we can just rename it to the out radiance and just return it as the fragment color. 
So this shader actually only uses the global buffer, so we can remove all the inputs and texture bindings as well as this BRDF function, right? Maybe we could keep the empty input structure in case we want to pass something later. Uh, that shouldn't really make any difference. So it's a really simple shader in the end. It doesn't even use most of the global values, which suggests that we could maybe have a different one just for rendering the light visualization, especially later when we will deal with multiple lights. But for now it should be fine, since it's a debug visualization after all, so let's go to the vertex shader now. Let's see. We still need the view projection matrix and we still need the model matrix, since it contains the light actual position, right? But we don't need the normal matrix anymore. And for the vertex input we really only need the position because the color is determined purely by the light color passed to the fragment shader a uniform buffer, so let's remove everything but the position. For the output, since our fragment shader doesn't need anything, we only need to return the clip space uh, position system value. So let's just remove everything else and everything that fills that in our main function. Try to build the project and make sure that the shader is compiled successfully. So here is the generated code for the new shader. Now let's go back to the CPU side and set up rendering using those shaders. So first we need a new SDL graphics pipeline. So let's add one to our game state, maybe next to the first pipeline here. Call it something like this, light shape pipeline. Then we'll need to store the light cube mesh uh, that we're gonna draw, so let's add a field for that as well. Now let's go to the game init and next to the setup pipeline add a call to something like setup light shape pipeline. Also while we are here, let's create our uh, light shape mesh uh, somewhere inside our copy pass, like here. Let's make it smaller, like 20 centimeters or something like that. Now to implement our light shape procedure, let's maybe just start by copying the previous one. Rename it to the name that we use it in the init call. Change the loaded shader names. Now let's take a look at the vertex attributes. Our vertex shader takes only the position, right? So let's just remove everything else. Let's assign it to the new game state field, of course, not to overwrite our uh, object rendering pipeline. And everything else seems to be fine as it is. We want the depth testing, we want culling, and we are drawing to the same uh, color target. Now we don't need to create the sampler again here. And in fact, samplers can be reused between different pipelines. Uh, so. It's really more a property of a texture, I think. But even then it could be actually reused between different textures too. So maybe we should also go to the original setup pipeline, cut it from here, and just put it into the game init function next to the pipeline setups. Okay, so now we simply go to our game render procedure. And here, just before drawing our entities, let's add a block that bins our light shape pipeline, constructs the lights model matrix using the Linalc translate and the light position, and pushes it directly to the vertex uniform slot one. We should probably have a proper structure for this, like we do for the entities, uh, but since it's just a single field, we can push it itself for now. This is kind of a debug visualization anyway, and if we ever get to the point of developing something closer to a real engine here, we'll likely have another more dynamic way to create pipelines and their data binnings at run time, so let's not care too much about this. Finally, we bin the vertex and index buffers uh, of our light shape mesh and call draw GPU index primitives uh, function exactly like we do for entities, except that we don't bind any textures here. And that already should be enough to see a nice light cube in our game world. So let's run the game. And see, here it is. We can move it around, of course. Change its intensity. Change its color. Oh look, there's a bug in our cube shape. The bug face isn't lit up properly. So that looks like an issue with a normal 
and indeed it is so you see the normal was just copy pasted from the front so the backside normal should point forward so let's just add a minus here so this looks pretty nice already let's maybe do some quick cleanups before we wrap up first since we now have two pipelines, let's rename the first one to something like object pipeline or something. As I mentioned, for a real thing, the pipelines would be dynamically generated for materials. But we are of course nowhere there yet, and this kind of stuff might not be even needed for a small game. But a clear naming didn't hurt anyone, so let's call it maybe entity pipeline, because we use the term entity for the objects that we render using this pipeline. Let's also rename the sampler field maybe to default sampler to avoid potential confusion since we might have different ones in the future. And finally I wanted to change the minification and magnification rules uh, to use the bilinear filtering because the models I use here have a particular UV mapping that creates a pretty nasty flickering artifacts when using the default nearest pixel sampling. It's probably really difficult to see with a YouTube compression, but if you run the project locally and try to move around, uh, for example, next to the uh, sedan here, you will see that it's uh, kind of flickering in ugly ways. If we open the model here in Blender, we can see that the UVs here are right at the border of color map pixels. So if I zoom in, it's very visible here, right? So with a uh, nearest pixel filtering, uh, because of minor floating point imprecisions, the sampler will constantly switch between slightly different colors here, like right, like between, for example, darker red and lighter red, and this is what is happening. And the linear filtering should make it a bit more bearable, so let's change it. So remember, the GPU sampler create info has this min and mag filter fields, and those can be nearest or linear, so let's set them to linear. Yeah, that looks much better. Oh, and the last minor aesthetical thing that we could do is make our clear color the same as our ambient color. This way it's gonna look more like the ambient illumination is actually coming from the environment. So hopefully more believable. So let's remove the field. Remove it from the initialization. Remove the inspector widget. And here we should use the ambient light color. However, in Odin by default, we cannot create a float 4 out of float 3 easily. Because remember, our ambient light color is VEC3, while clear color is uh, float 4. So let's just create a local variable like clear color. Simply set it to 1. That will set it to 1 in all the components. And then we can simply assign our ambient color to the RGB magic field in the float 32 vector which f color essentially is. So let's replace the clear color with a local variable now. Run the game. And now even if we turn the light off, we can kinda see that uh, the ambient lighting is coming from the eternal void around our objects. And if we change the color it kind of seems a bit more believable that this is what causes them to be illuminated this particular way. Alright, that's enough for now. I think with our simple mesh generation it's now easier to explore some other topics, like cube maps for example, and probably that's gonna be the topic for the next time, so stay tuned.